Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Tom Turner. I'm the lead pastor at Praise Family Church in Mobile, Alabama, and I am thrilled and excited that you're joining us for this very special program. We have something that we really think a lot about, and that is the church and how we relate to it. In fact, over the next few weeks, we're gonna be talking about the family business. And it's just how we relate as people of God in the church where God's planned us. We hope you'll be joining us every time. And in fact, if you'd like more information about Praise Family Church, Stay tuned at the end and we'll tell you more about how you can be more connected in what we're doing. How's everybody doing today? Awesome, awesome. It was good to see you. I'm excited about what God's going to do. Before we get to the Word, you can turn to Psalm 127. I'm not going to have you read there. I'll explain in a minute. You can turn to Hebrews 3, Galatians 4. That's some of the verses we're going to be, be reading from in the next few minutes. Uh, while you're doing that, if you don't have the app, get it so you can follow the notes. It's important. God's going to speak to you. You need to write it down. I, I found out that helps me so much. I don't want to forget or miss what God's saying. While you're doing that, let me mention, if you don't come on Wednesday nights, you need to make it part of your week. We call it family night for a reason. It's for the whole family. We have, we have ministry for children, for students, young adults and adults. And what we've done the last couple of weeks is we've been having something for our men and our women. The PFC ladies have been meeting. And they're really excited about it. <laughs> and the PFC men have been meeting. Yeah. Ooh. So they've been doing some cool stuff. So Wednesday night, my wife decided that they would have banana splits. So they had all the little boats and the stuff and the toppings and all that. I said, yeah, well, not to be outdone, we did man banana splits. We had ice cream sandwiches and bananas. Didn't have to wash dishes, just threw stuff. Well, come on, guys. It worked out, right? There we go. So we'll have some fun this week. Be here. Join us. It's going to be a great time, great way to get connected, to know somebody. That should have given you plenty of time. We're going to start with prayer this morning. I, I just believe God wants to do something very, very special for the next few minutes. So we want to hear from him. Amen? Amen. Father, we just focus our attention now on you. I pray that you speak to us. Lord, that you'd reveal yourself, that your word would come alive in each one of us, Lord, that, we, that our hearts would be good ground, that our ears are open, we're not distracted by anything going on, but we're focused every fiber of our being on what you have to say today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer, and let everybody say it, amen. amen. Most of you have been here any length of time, you know I was raised in church. I'm real blessed today because all the Turner boys, I believe Kevin's here, oh yeah, he's working. God, we got you to do something. Wow. <laughs> I knew he was here because I saw him early, but all three of the Turner boys are here. My older brother, Phil, and his wife, Annette, are here. And Kevin and Astro are here, and the best-looking, smartest one's here, too. I thought some might say amen. Come on, folks. <laughs> At least humor me. But no, I'm honored to have... But we were raised in pastor's home. You know, we talk about that. Our dad pastored one church for a long time, and uh, we were raised to, to understand that church was more than just something we go to is more than just part of a week it really was our family our church family was our family so we really understood that but as I went into ministry I began to really grasp that in a way I never had before God began to teach me some things and and how I view church and how important family is and, and it really started just a few years I really began to get that before I even knew I was going to be a pastor and so I brought that with me when I came to praise the pastor of PFC uh, God had downloaded some important things especially in this first uh passage I'm going to read this morning and some of the ones we're going to use today. God began to teach me things about the importance of how we serve in the church and why we serve that way. So we want to get right to that. And that's why it's been part of our DNA since 1995. 
And yes, that's a long time ago, I know. So in Psalm 127, I told you I wasn't going to have you read that because the version I'm going to use you do not have because it's from a, um, a, a book, a study Bible that's now out of print. I wish they still had it. It's phenomenal. It's called, the Word, it's called God's Word, the Bible in 26 Translations. So it takes the best parts of 26 translations as a study tool. It's, not, it's hard to read if you just read through it, but it's great. In fact, I only know of two uh, in existence in this part of Alabama. I have one. Pastor Jeremy has the other because years ago his mom contacted me and said, is there any way we can get Jeremy one of those? Because before he was in ministry, anything, he was interested in studying the Word. So we found one, and they gave it to him for Christmas or something. So he has the other one. Uh, I wish you could get one, but that's what I'm reading from today. So it will really help us. Psalm 127 from the 26th translation says this, Unless the Lord builds a house, its construction is of no purpose. Wow, we'll get into that in a minute. Sons are a heritage and a legacy from God, a reward that comes from Him. Strong sons are like arrows in a hero's hand. Oh, the blessedness of the man who has filled his quiver with arrows of this sort. So, we're keenly aware in this church that God is a builder. And what He's building is a mighty, mighty church. Now understand, we're not arrogant to believe that we are the mighty, mighty church. We understand we're kind of like the bedroom of his great house, the big C church, that we're part of that, and we get to be part of his mighty, mighty church by being plugged into our local church. And God is such a builder that when he decided to come to earth, he came as a carpenter. That's because he's a builder, right? I don't think that was an accident. I think that's because he does understand what it means to construct things. And in Psalm 127, we just read, and I love this version of it because it tells us something real important because it tells us what he's building. And so, again, that first line, verse 1 says, unless the Lord builds a house, listen to this, its construction is of no purpose. So if we try to build a church, and we've all done this at times. I mean, even in the ministry, there have been times when I did something I thought would work, and I realized it wasn't led by God, and it didn't work very well. Come on. So really, what's the purpose? If it's not God's, and it's not Jesus leading it, we're wasting our time. Amen? So we want to hear that. So um, I want you to write this down. House, he, he says, unless the Lord builds a house, house is a spiritual metaphor for family. All the time in the Bible, you hear things like house of Jacob. And you know it's talking about the lineage of Jacob or the family of Jacob, the house of David, right? And so uh, that's important that we get that. And it's not just talking about the immediate family, but it's talking about preceding generations. In fact, we know from studying the Bible that the Bible tells us that when those who follow God and love God, they can get the blessings of heaven down to a thousand generations. Way after we're gone, if Jesus tarries, our kids and our kids' kids and our kids' kids' kids and our kids' 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 kids, and our, okay, can still be blessed. Somebody ought to be holding on to that because today it feels a little bit hopeless, but you stand on God's promise, you're going to see it come to pass. Amen. Amen. I believe that will lie in my heart. That's what we stand on all the time. So God's speaking of his, here, he's talking about his seed line, right? His family in the earth. And so we need to understand how he, how he does that. He's building a family. It's a great house, and we get to be a part of that. And he has a certain way that works, and that's what we've been talking about as we talk about Club G, uh, PFC. Uh, you know, a lot of people looked at me funny the first week, and, I, and, and the new people, every time I say this, at first there's a pause because I said, this club that we're part of, we are a club. People say, oh, you, you're like a club. Well, we are in a sense. And I said this, this club is not for everybody. And the same thing happened to me. Was dead. What? But it is for anybody. And what I mean is not that we're not open to anybody, but the truth is the Bible says that the vast majority of people will choose not to follow Christ, even though God is not willing that any should perish. He wants every person to go to heaven. He wants every person to follow him, but people choose not to. So we want everybody to come here, but we recognize one or two things. One is not everybody's going to come here, and not even every Christian's going to come here. Just the best ones. Come on. We know that. We're not the only ones, right? But we, we understand the part God has, and so we get to be a part of that. So God's a family man. It's important to understand what he's building, he will protect. He's going to protect his church. And the psalmist we just read says, this is how he protects it. With what? Sons. Now, remember, when we say sons, if this is the first time you're hearing this, it's not, that's, forget gender, gen, gender. Don't think about gender. Don't think about age. It's talking about attitude of heart. So whether you're female or male, whether you're old or young, you can be a son. It's talking about a heart issue, and that's what we're going to get into a little bit more today for you to understand. So we don't have to worry. God intends for his church to rise up and shine, 
right? That's what the Bible says, that the, that the, the, the latter rain, the latter portion of this house is going to be greater than anything we've seen before. And how many of you know what we're seeing now is not the best days of the church yet? Uh, it pales in comparison to some things from the past that so we know God's not done. No matter how dark it gets, it's going to get better. No matter how terrible it seems, don't whine about it. Quit watching the news and listen to a bunch of talking heads and get in your word and understand. It might be dark today, but what God's got coming is going to be better. The darker it gets, the more His grace can shine. Why should we be shocked when the world turns against the things of God? So it's time for the church to step up. So, but here's how he's going to do it. We have to remain in this. The security and the safety of the house in which we've been planted. That's how he's designed it. Can somebody say amen? Okay, so I mentioned Hebrews chapter 3. I want us to go there and read a, a very important uh, passage that kind of delineates what we're talking about when it comes to sons. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Hebrews chapter 3. If you have Spirit-Filled Life Bible, it's 1875 is the page number. Uh, but, um, but I'm reading it from the New Living Translation. If you don't have that version, it is on the wall. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those who call or who those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God, who appointed him just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident and our hope in Christ. So we're part of God's house, right? And we're, if we're in his house, it says today in the new covenant, the version is that we're not just servants who serve, right? It says here that Christ was the, over his house as a son. And it doesn't say Moses was evil. It just says he did a good job, but he wasn't as good as the son. Come on. Old covenant was a servant. New covenant, sonship. Are you with me? So whose house are we in? God's, God's house, and Jesus is actually the head of the church, right? So if we're in his house and he says, this is how you serve, how did he serve? As a son. So how are we supposed to serve? As a son. Now think about this word servant. That word servant means an individual who performs duties for a master or personal employer. And people say, well, isn't that a good thing? Aren't we supposed to serve? Absolutely. Son serve and servant serve. But we tell you, the difference is in attitude and heart, how a how a servant serves or a slave serves versus how a son who has the agenda of the house and the father in his heart or her heart. Again, forget gender, forget age, think about attitude. That's what we're talking about. Son serve and servant serve. The difference is how we serve. What's our motive? Now, I want to tell you, this will help us as we lay this foundation. We'll get into this some more next week, but this will be a good uh, launching part for the next couple of weeks. So God builds three ways. And so I want to show you three ways God builds. This helps you. And to save time, I won't turn in my Bible, even though I have it marked in my Bible. Uh, it'll be on the screen. And if you have a Bible, I, concern, I, I encourage you, if you can, to mark it, because these are important scriptures. So God builds three ways. Number one, he builds revelationally. Revelationally. That's the revelation of who Christ is. The revelation of who Christ is. We, we turn to Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18. Jesus is talking to Peter and to his people, to his disciples specifically. He said to them, the Bible says, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Listen to this. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Well, maybe you've been told that Peter is the rock the church was built on. Maybe you were taught that he's the first pope, or maybe you've been taught that that's really the foundation of the church. And although Peter was a leader in starting the first church, in fact, he preached the first big message to see 3,000 people come to the church in one day, right, coming to the kingdom. And that's fantastic. But I want to remind you that just a few days before that, he denied he even knew Jesus and called curses on himself. So he had to be restored, and there's a whole story there. But I want you to understand something. When, he, when, he, when Jesus says, this is the rock, he's not talking about Peter. There's only one rock. 
The Bible says Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's the mountain when we build everything on it. He's the foundation of the church. Amen? So Peter was not the rock, but the revelation that Peter had was. So write that down. Real important that you get that. Um, P- the found, uh, Peter wasn't the foundation. Uh, the, the rock was, right? I mean, sorry, the statement was. Peter wasn't the rock. I'll get it right. The revelation was. So he might have been a rock head. I mean, if you know Peter, he, was, he could be hard-headed, right? Anybody can identify with that. You know, he, there was some thing God used that. His personality was really strong and sometimes um, tough and harsh. But God used that in a lot of ways as well. But he became one of the great leaders of the church, and we appreciate that. But what he understood, that, look, if you, if you want to go to a church, if they don't have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, if they just have him as part of the story or just part of the answer, if a church teaches with well, Jesus is just one way, not the only way, because Jesus says, I'm, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the, no one comes to the Father except through me. If they say anything besides that, then they really aren't the church. A church can't be built on any other revelation other than Jesus Christ. Can I hear a great big amen? So we need Jesus. He is the way, and that's the only way to heaven. Come on, somebody. That's the foundation of everything he's building on, everything he's going to do, everything he wants to build in our lives starts with that. Secondly, after he builds revelationally, he also builds relationally. All right? So we're put into a family. So it's no accident that we are Praise Family Church. God led us to change the name when we began to grow and change. It was called Praise Assembly of God, and we called it Praise Family Church, not just because we, not because we want to be ashamed of who we were, but we wanted people to see the name of our church and understand what we were about. And that says a lot about our church because we always say family is our middle name. We begin to understand how important it is to be part of a church family. That word relationship just literally means joining together, that we're in a relationship, that we're joined together. How many of you know God doesn't want a fragmented church? Come on, he doesn't want us broken apart and going here and there. And, and, you know, we live in a disposable society. We have a mentality about disposable things. And uh, how many of you, now, come on, usually disposable means you use it and throw it away, right? And so we do a lot with relationships, and, 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 and there's a whole story there that we could take a long time to talk about that we want to, but we kind of get that in this country. Stefan's European, you may not have that same mentality, but Americans understand the disposable mentality. But let's be honest, how many of you, tell me the truth, you've actually washed the red Solo cups and reused them? (laughs) Why? You have glasses. Wash them. You know what red Solo cups are for? To throw away. So we had a lady, it was one of our our board members' wives when I lived in in, uh, Florida, a great, wonderful person. But she did not have a disposable mentality. So you, the first time we went to her house, beautiful home, we go to their house, and they have the board and the pastors, and we're there. And I had been around, but I'd never been there for a dinner before. And she has this um, wonderful dinner, right? Uh, and so she gets done, and she said she had some great food left over. And I don't want to say too much because I don't want, if, if somebody from there is watching, I don't want them to know who I'm talking about. Um, and she had some great food. She was a great cook. And she said, how many would like to take some things home? So she said, Pastor Tom, would you go out in the garage and get, get the plates, the takeaway things? I said, well, certainly. So I go out there looking for Normal, American, common sense, round plates. And I came back and said, all I see is on your one wall is a green, a bunch of green things. You know what they were? Do you remember? You, you'd have to be a little bit older. When you got, used to get grapes and, and fruit and stuff, they had this compressed kind of green cardboard, light green cardboard. They, do you remember what I'm talking about? She never threw those away. She washed them, dried them out. And if you went home from her house, that's what she sent in. She would not pay for disposable plates. She would not, that, so that's her, that was her disposable plates. And I said, these are supposed to be thrown away. She said, well, you can throw them away later. But if you want to, if you'll bring them back, I'll wash them and use them again. <laughs> and on top of that, I start looking around. We're making people's plates. And, you know, they're not very big. So, you know, and so I, so I start looking. She said, what are you looking for? I said, like saran wrap or aluminum foil. She goes, oh, no. She starts pulling out. Uh, bread bags and bun bags that she had saved and rinsed out or wiped out. She had Ziploc bags that she had washed out and hung up. This lady had no clue of disposable, right? So some of you are like that. But I got to tell you, we use red cups and throw away plates at my house because when the kids and grandkids come, they don't think they got to wash dishes. PTA ain't washing the dishes for them. So we say, throw it in the garbage, we're done, Right? 
<laughs> How many do that? That's, so that's what it's, oh, anyway. But we have a tendency because of that to think that everything in our life is just temporary. We treat church that way. We treat relationships that way. There's a whole story about marriage, how we treat it disposable sometimes. But here's the deal. God says, I don't want this to be a short-term thing. I, I want to do something that's built on a relationship that lasts, right? Because we have a tendency because of that. And again, that American mentality of, hey, I want to do what I want to do. We're real independent. The things God blesses us with is also can be our curse a little bit. And so we'll say, I want to go where I want. I want to do what I want to do. I'm going to pick my church. And I think you need to hear from God, and you need to look and seek. But how about we listen to God? Because uh, Psalms 92, 13 says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Can I submit to you, if that's true, which we know it is, then that means if I'm not flourishing spiritually, it may be that I haven't let God plant me where he wants me. I'm not doing what he's called me to. Come on, somebody. Because he says, when you get planted and you do what I tell you to do, you grow up, and that's where perfection comes. Not in you individually. We talked about that, where Paul says, you know, we all get together, and we all do our part, and each part does its share, and each one works together, you know, whatever each one supplies, until we come into maturity, till we grow up into a perfect man. We're not by ourselves perfect, but together we make up the perfect bride of Christ. That's why you can come after a, a, a bride that's without spot or wrinkle. See, I hear people sometimes say, well, Jesus is coming back, and there's no way he's coming back right now because the church isn't perfect. Well, nobody's perfect, but together, the Bible says, when we're all doing our part, then we walk in perfection outside of ourselves in the goodness and the power of a Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in us. That's where the perfection is. That's what makes us without spot or wrinkle. I, that's just incredible how God can do that. we got to move on. By the way, when you're in that kind of relationship, you don't just jump ship when things start getting bad. The family, you know, he said, the Bible says God's going to protect the house. He protect the house with sons, right? We'll get into that in a few minutes. Okay, and the third thing is generationally. He builds generationally. And that's long-term, and the other word that Hebrew uses is perpetually. So we're not just in this to get through this next few months. I want you to understand God wants us to get a vision of how he looks at things. You remember, I mentioned it briefly a few moments ago, that when he blesses, he says, I'll bless you down to a thousand generations. You know, Jesus might be coming back tonight, but I'm going to pass on vision, and I'm going to pass on purpose, and I'm going to pass on what God's doing in my house to my family and to my family's kids and my kids' kids and kids' kids, kids like we said. And I'm going to do that. In case he doesn't come tonight, I'm going to keep passing on that vision, and that's how God wants to do it, right? He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen to Psalm 103, 17. But, Lord, your endless love stretches from one eternity to the other, unbroken and unrelenting toward those who fear you and those who bow face down in awe before you. I love this part as we go to verse 18. Your faithfulness to keep every gracious promise you've made passes from parent to children to grandchildren and beyond. You are faithful to all those who follow your ways and keep your word. Look, we need to understand how God builds. He's not just building something temporary. He's not just building something hoping you can get by. Oh, if I could just God get by and make it to heaven, I want to make it to heaven. But as long as Jesus tarries, I want the progeny of Tom Turner to serve God. Whether it's my children, my grandchildren, my great-great-grandchildren, and those who are all far off at this point, God's calling them in. And that's the promise I can stand on and what we need to stand on and understand. This isn't just what we're doing for now. We're building something that's eternal. And he does it through his house. Amen? That's what he calls us to. God is building, doing all this so we can take cities for his kingdom. I love what Stefan and Morgan shared about reaching Vienna. What a powerful thing. What a vision. Not only did we see, because when you reach a city, you're reaching the world, especially in a place like that. That's what God's called us to. Do you know, I said it last week, I think, but if we took all the people who are not in church today and we tried to put them in a church, they wouldn't fit. Because the devil's crowd is bigger than all the churches in Mobile put together. Come on. But we have, so we have work to do. We have people to reach. Come on. We have cities to reach. Let me hurry as we get to Galatians chapter 4, one of my favorite foundational scriptures that I've used. And we, we quote it so often and miss some of the most important parts of it as we kind of start winding this down. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crown out, Abba, Father. You've heard people talk about that. It's like Daddy God. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Write this down. God's answer to the human predicament was a son, not a slave. Jesus came as the son. He says, here's how we want you to emulate what I'm going to do and what I want to do. If you're not fulfilled, if you're not completely walking out what you feel like God wants you to do, it's because maybe you're trying to serve him the way the world serves things. And Jesus says, look, I want to give you a new revelation. I want you to understand that I have a purpose and a plan for you, and it involves you, it involves your church, but it is a promise for your whole family. In the New Covenant, you're a son of the Father's house. When you give your heart to Jesus, you have a stake in the whole deal. Everything that happens here, this is, yeah, it's our club, if you will. But we're trying to get as many people to join as possible. Everybody's welcome. But it takes a lot of us to get it happen. Every time somebody joins this church with the different gifts and different abilities and they plug in, it changes us. It makes us better. We believe in the process because it says one can put 1,000 to flight and two can put 10,000 to flight. So often we just use that as a spiritual metaphor for for warfare. But I want you to know something. As the church of Jesus Christ, as a person joins our church and lets God use him or her in a special way, and they take the place of a son and begin to serve with whatever gifts that happen to be in their life at that time, God begins to do something new and make us better. And I tell people, you make us better than we were because God has brought you to us. And if you're here and you're watching, you're kind of like outside looking in, let me encourage you to find your place. Find your place. I want to be a son. See, because you can trust sons because they have the heart of the house. They have the heart of the father. Hirelings have a mentality of where's sundown and payday. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John 10, 12. The hireling leaves the sheep and flees when he sees the wolf coming. They don't have a stake in the club. They're not like a son. See, son, we used to call it, we've called it before, we called it family business. You know, it's like the family, you know, you have a different take on it. You're not just there getting a paycheck, right? You're there to serve, and God's called you to it. And how you serve depends on what kind of heart you have. A hireling gets out of there. Fire comes. A wolf comes. The Bible says they take off. But a son says, I'm here. I don't care if the ship starts sinking. I'm riding in. I believe God's got something here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect this thing. The Bible says God uses sons to protect the house. Right? He wants to do that. And listen, however you serve, no matter what you're doing, it, it, whether you're, whether you're uh, serving in, in, in a, 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 what you think is a little tiny ministry or, or you're, you're, you know, you're, you're serving as a, as a pastor, the truth is, can I tell you something? Whether you're an employee or a Sunday volunteer, I want to tell you something. I don't even like that word anymore. Because when we say volunteer, we delineate by he's paid, she's not. Well, boy, that, isn't that really, think about it. That's short-sighted thinking on our part. Because the Bible says, when I'm given to the kingdom of God, my time, I might be volunteering, but the Bible says I'm laying up treasures in heaven. Come on. Jesus pays way better than the world does. In fact, he says, when you give your life and you give your finances, you give your time to help people that can't pay you back, he says, I'll pay you back. I want God to owe me, not somebody. Come on, somebody. So, so you're, you might think, well, I'm just a volunteer. Don't even listen to that. God uses sons, and he wants to do that. Let's close this thing. Here's the point. The highest pattern of the new covenant is sonship not servanthood. Man, they just expect so much out of me. That's what a hireling says. It's like a chore. I want to tell you something. People look around here and they say, man, it's like a click. And I got to tell you, it kind of is. It's not because we don't invite people. It's because when you get in here and you get, click, you get, get together with people, here people always ask, do you have small groups? And we do. In fact, we're in a season of doing something different with the Wednesday nights, but we're doing small groups on Wednesday nights. But the truth is, our real small groups or whatever ministry you're serving in. Because, I mean, the, the, the youth leaders, the student leaders, they hang out together. They go eat together. They have, they have things in common. They're, they're buddies. They go play golf together. They go out and they do things together. Those who on the worship team, they, they, they interact with each other. Last night we found out about Mr. Cecil because he's connected through Grands, our seniors ministry. So people were calling each other. Word was getting around, and the church was there. And Pastor Jeremy and I got to be there moments after he passed because... We have connection, and we're able to minister to the family. 
So the best way you can get connected and feel apart is join the church. This isn't a political agenda. We don't need to vote on what color the carpet's going to be. Because if I said, okay, we're going to put in a new carpet, which we really need to do, and new chairs, we want to do that. Okay, how many want to make a nomination of a color? We're going to take the top 30 and vote on them. We'd still have to knock out some. But when we join together and say, I'm a member because I want to be part of the family business. I want to be part of Club PFC. I want, because together we have an agenda to reach people for the kingdom of God. And we're all going to do our part so that we're mature and we're perfected to be the body of Christ. Can somebody say amen? Last thing. We are sons of God. We have a stake in our club. Sons. We have old women sons, young boy sons, middle-aged teenager sons. Some are women, some are men, some are children, some are adults, some are students. But you know what? We're all sons in the house. And on that, he says, I'll build my church. The revelation of who Jesus is and how he builds is what keeps the gates of hell from prevailing against his house. Can somebody say a great big amen and thank God for that. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand to your feet? Would you just stand with me and raise your hands? I want to pray for you. We're going to worship. God's going to do something. He's calling sons into the fold. I pray for that all the time. I pray for souls every week. God, bring us souls, but I also pray God, raise up sons. I pray it every week. God, bring in sons, raise up, bring in souls, raise up sons. Give us disciples who become sons, who help us. Because what we have to do is so much bigger than any one of us, but not too big for all of us when we do it Jesus' way. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we just submit ourselves to you. We want to be sons in this house. We want to be used of you in a mighty way. We want your name to be glorified. Lord, it's not about me. It's not about my agenda. It's about the agenda of what you want to do, what you place in this house. To, Lord, that we can thrive. We can flourish in this house because you put us here. And God, what we're going to do is it pales in comparison to what we've already done. We have so much more to do. And I thank you as you add sons to this house. Then we're going to see a mighty outpouring of your spirit in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces. And not because we stand and scream at the darkness, but because we join arms and link and love people and serve and take the mantle as a son to do what you've called us to do. Our club, Club PFC, to win people to Jesus Christ. Can somebody say a great big amen? Come on, church. Let's give them a shout of praise for that. Oh, come on. What an honor. Raise your hands and let's worship together. Come on. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you'll tune in next time. If you want more information about Praise Family Church, or if you think you might like to visit us sometimes, you can find out a lot of information at praisefamily.church. Maybe you'd like to partner with us to make these broadcasts possible. You can text the word GIVING to 313131, or you can mail an offering to the address you see on the screen. But whatever you do, we want to continue to be a blessing to you. We want to be a help to you. And we want to let you see that God has got great things in store for you. And he has a plan for your life. We hope you'll continue to tune in and you'll be a part as Praise Family Church continues to tell the good news around the world.